Damn. Did you wait to go by um, by uh, Robert or by Bob? Bob. Okay. If I, will, if, I, will, if, I, if I get if I get going too far, Robert is usually a buzzword that causes me causes me to refocus. Okay. Um, we will have to put out your full um, legal name on when we introduce you. Okay. Um, but then I, I'll refer to you as Bob from. Yep. From that. Okay. okay. You ready, Victor? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Robert Franklin. I'm conducting an oral history interview with Robert James Parr on November 17th, 2016. The interview is being conducted on the campus of Washington State University, Tri-Cities. I will be talking with Bob about his experiences working at the Hanford site. And for the record, can you state and spell your name? My last name is spelled Parr, P-A-R-R. My first name is Robert, R-O-B-E-R-T. My middle name is James, J-A-M-E-S. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, so tell me how and why you came to the area to work at Hanford. In, uh, I graduated in WSU itself in uh, 1973 with a degree in police science and administration. In, in Pullman. Pullman, the big campus. And after I graduated, I went into work into uh, law enforcement. And I ended up in the late 70s working for the state of Washington, State Liquor Control Board, long before cannabis, as an enforcement officer. Uh, it was a it was a it was a, a good agency, both regulatory and criminal enforcement. So it, it was uh, no day was the same. But when I looked at it, the pay and benefits uh, weren't what I thought they would be. And then I noticed uh, I saw an ad in the I believe it was either the Seattle Times or Seattle Post Intelligencer that Atlantic Richfield Hanford Arco was looking for people to work for them uh, in their uniform security uh, group called the Hanford Patrol. So I, I checked it out and I found out that their pay was much better than I was working uh, th for the state. So I went and interviewed with them at uh, a hotel, uh, I think it was the Doubletree, or is the Doubletree now, at South Center in Renton, Washington. So I did the interview. Uh, and I noticed that everyone else being interviewed, we were all ex-military or law enforcement. So I took the interview and then uh, uh, they offered me a job. I had previously applied with ARCO and of course at that time the transition occurred, so it was now Rockwell Hanford. Um, so I, they offered me a job starting in, uh, I interviewed uh, I think sometime in the December time frame and then in uh, right after New Year's they offered me a job. Uh, starting to work on uh, in February 1980. So I, I, uh, I was married at the time, so we moved over to Tri-Cities, got an apartment, and uh, I had done my physical and all the screening before, and then I started to work uh, for Rockwell Hanford in February 1980. Uh, I was, uh, my initial employment, or my initial job was with Hanford Patrol. So they uh, had their own, they called it an academy. Uh, and it was at what is the 1100 area, which used to be uh, the uh, one of the activities we did at the 1100 area was the bus lot, because we had buses on site. So at the office where the bus uh, buses were dispatched from, about the back third of it was the Hanford Patrol Training Academy. It wasn't much, but that's where I went to work. And train, initial training is about seven weeks. While I was there, I received my, uh, I already had had a uh, clearance from the Department of Energy Security Clearance. So my security clearance showed up, and I, then I, since I had a security clearance, uh, many of my peers in the in this class, there were about 20 or 30 of us, didn't have clearances, so they were work approvals, what we called WAs, but I had my Q security clearance, so I went right to work. And I, uh, or my first assignment was uh, in 200 West, 200 East, and 100 N, so I worked out in the north end of the site for a few months, and then I got reassigned to 300 area, which was uh, a composite area of, we did fuels production and research there. So it was the contractors, we had uh, Rockwell providing security and fire services uh, and transportation. Uh, United Nuclear was operating fuels production for the end reactor at the north end of 300 area. We also had uh, Northwest National Labs, Battelle Memorial was operating in the area, they had several facilities. And then Westinghouse Hanford was doing fuels production and research for the fast flux test facility, which wasn't online yet, but almost was nearing completion. 
So I did that for, um, I was there for quite some time. And then about less than six months after I showed up, I got promoted. Uh, ha the Hanford Project, uh, the security, uniform security and, and protection on site, hadn't really adjusted to changing times in society. Uh, we uh, They issued us revolvers, and that was when auto revolvers were starting to be phased out. Oh. Mm -hmm. And uh, automatics or uh, a more modern sidearm was being issued. Uh, so it was, it, and the, the big the big change was technology was their alarm systems. So uh, Westinghouse Hanford had led the way. They uh, they actually wrote the software. We were using a computer operated security system at three and four hundred areas. Uh, four hundred being a fast flux test facility. Mm -hmm. So I got to. Uh, I got to get in on the ground floor of that, and we I participated in the acceptance test uh, process for both three and four hundred areas, and uh, we brought the system online. Uh, it was state of the art. Westinghouse and uh, had gone out and found the best equipment and the best systems, and then wrote their own software for the system. So it was uh, it was much beyond the old. Uh, analog systems we used to have on site. Many alarm systems at that point, uh, particularly ones in, uh, at the Petonium finishing plant, were technology from the 50s and were probably installed in the 60s. Okay. And here it was the 80s and the mid 80s by now. So we did that and eventually uh, Rockwell, um, they also put in a similar system at uh, Plutonium finishing plant, but they had a problem. The people they hired to write their software were two guys in a garage. And it didn't go well. Um, God bless them for trying, but it didn't go well. So they ended up buying the Westinghouse software, and then they had their software people come in and make some adjustments to it based on their equipment. So they were they were similar systems. So I got qualified to operate all of them, and uh, shortly thereafter I got uh, promoted again. So now instead of being a, a supervisor at an alarm facility uh, on a rotating basis, I was now the the coordinator responsible for all fork rotating shifts uh, at uh, first at 300 area and then eventually at fast flux test facility. So I did that until uh, 1993. Um, during that time, um, Department of Energy was also ramping up its efforts on security, trying to be a little bit more professional and coming into a more modern era. So they had uh, developed a central training academy down at DOE Albuquerque at that field office. So they came uh, up to Hanford and they had developed a training program to teach supervisors on security forces how to train their employees. So I took it and that worked good, but I was also, a, uh, when I first moved to Tri-Cities, I was in the Coast Guard Reserve and I drilled at Station Kennewick, a small uh, search and rescue and aids to navigation station. So I drilled there, but the Coast Guard started downsizing in the Reagan administration. Uh, so I shifted over the Army National Guard, and shortly after I joined the National Guard, they sent me to a school uh, to learn how to be a, uh, what the Army called an instructor. So all of a sudden I had two pieces of paper, one from the Department of Energy and one from the Army, saying I was an instructor. Well, in 1993 I was offered a job at Plutonium Finishing Plant with the training department. So in the fall of 93, um, I left uh, uh, Safeguard and Security, the Hanford Patrol, and went to work at uh, Plutonium Finishing Plant as, an, as a, it wasn't, uh, you could call an instructor, but the official job title was training specialist. And then it was, uh, they went through several changes, so I think I've been a technical instructor, I've been a senior training specialist, and so at four or five different job title changes, same job. And at, uh, at Petonium Finishing Plant, um, they hadn't quite, uh, they had a vacancy, they, so they put me in it. And initially, uh, my manager's idea was, well, you can assist someone on, their, on a key training project. So I got assigned as uh, the second instructor on several training projects. And then one day, um, he walked in, the manager walked in, and he was looking for uh, one of the employees that I was paired up with on one of the projects. And he said, well, where is he? And I said, I don't know. He said, well, are you running that class today? And I go, what class? 
because we hadn't even, the, my peer and I hadn't even talked about it. So next thing I know, I was now the instructor responsible for per person in charge at Plutonium Finishing Plant. And it was a program we set up in response to a finding. Um, when you have a, an event at, at, in those days, they would investigate it and then they would figure out what the corrective actions would be. So the finding, the corrective action was that we would start a training program at Plutonium Finishing Plant for person in charge. So we mirrored it after a similar program at FFTF. Uh, and next thing I know, I'm running a training program, and uh, we're putting all the supervisors, the workforce supervisors in the plant, are going through it so they can learn how to uh, perform work at the plant. All our, almost all our work at the plant was done to either procedures or work package, and work packages were usually maintenance or construction related. So I got to be the, my title soon became the Pickmeister, because not only did I have to provide or coordinate their training, but I also had to uh, develop their certification and qualification. Mm. So I did that much of the time I was there. And then other programs started going my way. I also ended up teaching safety bases, because at a, at a uh, DOE facility, it's somewhat similar to the Nuclear, Re uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission regulated facility, an, opera an operating commercial reactor. But their idea is that the safety basis is those documents, those commitments that have been made on how the plant can be operated. In other words, it's your operating it to a, to a non-commercial um, DOE facility, it's, it's your operating license. Okay. So every time we proposed an activity, we had to look, or even a, sometimes even a construction or maintenance package, we had to ensure it was in, within the safety basis. So I ended up teaching that course. And um, then I, so pretty soon, my work focus seemed to be emergent training. Anything we had, a, we had an event or an incident where training was needed the day before yesterday, it ended up on my plate. So that's what I did. And... Um, by that time, I was in the Army National Guard, uh, and then after 9-11 happened, um, the 27th of September that year, I got a phone call at work telling me to come in. So I, I cleared work as fast as I could, came home. My daughter, my, my eldest daughter was living with me. She fixed a, a box lunch for me, and I got in the car, and I started driving towards Fort Lewis. And then I, that first time I was gone, 16 months, then I was home, and then I left again for a year and a half. Went to Iraq twice, and then I came back. And in between that, there was all kinds of little three- to four-week taskings from the Army. And then in 2008, I left uh, for four months and came back for three months. And then I left in uh, January 2010. I got a phone call, and the phone call was... Sergeant Major, are you going to be on the plane tomorrow? I go, what plane? Well, you're flying to Afghanistan tomorrow. Well, thanks. Could you send me a set of orders? So they, mm. they sent me a set, they faxed a set of orders, and I walked up a manager and said, I've got to leave. And that was about 9 o'clock in the morning, and by uh, before 11, I was signed, I was turning all my keys, my security badge and everything, and I was leaving. And then I didn't come home for two years. And I came back, and uh, by that time, uh, uh, President Obama was president of the United States. They used stimulus money at, uh, uh, to many federal agencies, and the Department of Energy took it. But their approach was a little different. Well, in the Army, we used some of it, but we hired companies to come in and do work for the Department of Defense, whereas DOE used the approach of having them, their contractors hire more employees. So I came back, and the stimulus money was running out, and they were staffed. So the next, uh, they offered a voluntary reduction of force, and a, a, a layoff, early retirement. Mm -hmm. So I asked my, what my retirement was worth. And they, so I, I drove down to, I think it was Stevens Center, not far from WSU Tri-Cities. And I walked in, and they went over my retirement with me. And God bless them, they gave me credit for time served. Not like a jail sentence, but credit right. for my time in the national uh, on active duty with the National Guard. So uh, I raised my right hand and said, "I'll take it," mm -hmm. and I left. And then uh, I left in the f 
my last day was uh, the end of September in 2011. And I was, uh, had four years of great veterans benefits uh, through the VA due. So I took my veterans benefits and I came back to WSU Tri-Cities this time. Uh, no athletic eligibility, so the university couldn't screw with me much. Mm -hmm. And I got another degree. And what's your degree? What was that degree? In? The second degree is a Bachelor of Arts in Social Sciences. Okay. So I got to take all those cool courses that, um, the first time around I declared my major my first year. And in the early 70s, once you declared your major, your goose was cooked, you took what they told you. Mm -hmm. You know, they offered you a very narrow pathway. Mm -hmm. And so this, the second time around, I got to take things, uh, fun things like economics and s lots of psychology and some English courses, um, a lot of history. So I, I, became, I think I developed into a, a better educated, a much broader person. That's really, that's, that's really fascinating. Yeah. Um, good to see someone come in the social sciences too, Yeah. Uh, as, a, as a historian. Um, so would, had you, uh, I, I see here on um, some of the notes Emma had written up that your father worked at Hanford as well. My father was an army officer, okay. and uh, Hanford started out as an army project, right. the Corps of Engineers, uh, and the DuPont Corporation, um, which was quite a corporation back in the day, or still is. But they did a lot of work for the government in the ordnance field. Mm -hmm. And the Navy used the approach, because uh, the Navy was heavily involved in, Man or not heavily, but involved in the Manhattan Project, so, and they were doing some of the uranium research. So the Navy ran it through their Ordnance Corps. The Army ran it through the Corps engineers, but the Corps engineers didn't have all the resources. So uh, one of the things is because at the time, Hanford was believed to be a viable target in the event of total war. So initially we cited, uh, my father was uh, coast artillery, which was what later became anti-aircraft artillery. So my father was one of the officers that was detailed here temporarily to cite the guns. Mm. And they did some sighting work and eventually that sighting work when they put the Nike, uh, one of the Nike systems of missiles to ring the Hanford site and also uh, I believe it around Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane. Uh, some of the sighting work that they had done back in the 40s was used to cite the missiles when I believe they were in place in the 50s. Mm. So my dad was here temporarily. Okay. He was one of a lot of a lot of army personnel came and went. Right. Um, I think people get the, and we even had MPs here. We of course had uh, anti-aircraft artillery, which later became air defense. Uh, so there was, for many years, there was a heavy army presence here. Mm -hmm. It wasn't totally. It wasn't like you'd see an army uniform everywhere. But Colonel Mathis was the commanding officer, uh, in a very unique approach, uh, having. Uh, because his approach was that, and uh, Dad told me about it, his approach was that he was a commanding officer and he was responsible. Uh, later, when I came back to work for you, I didn't see that same attitude with Department of Energy. Because mm -hmm. one of the things I noticed is on Department, and I worked for a lot of, contract, a lot of contractors. Uh, first started uh, looking at ARCO, then it was, when I came here, it was Rockwell Hanford, then it was Westinghouse Hanford, uh, then it was Babcock Wilcox, uh, which a lot of people think of them as the, the, the maritime boiler company, but they're also heavy into the nuclear business. A great company to work for. They were only here for a year, and then it was with Fleur. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, uh, when they broke up all the little contracts, I worked for a company called NREP, which was a training contractor, one of the training contractors on site. And then eventually, after I left, after I retired, NREP went away and they consolidated back. Mm -hmm. One of the things I noticed about DOE is you know, a contractor would be great. Of course, they don't screw with Battelle. Battelle, it's hard to screw with those guys because they do great work for a lot of different things. And they're on the cutting edge of so many different technologies, and they're so important to our national uh, well-being. But DOE would, you know, it would start beating up on the contractors. And so, you know, you know that contractor is probably going to be on its way out. And Department of Energy over the years, God bless them. They're great Americans. But they can't seem to make up their mind how they're going to run. Sometimes it's, you know, f when I first came here, it was five or six principal contractors, and then they went to one big contractor, and then they went broke it down again, and then they sub subcontracted out a lot of work, and now they're bringing it back all. So, um, do you think that has to do with the 
um, the fact that DO, the higher ups in DOE are subject to political appointments? Not only political appointments, but also the budget process. But I don't see that sh constant shifting. You see it in other federal agencies, cabinet level agencies, but not the extent that DOE does it. Mm. It's almost like, well, we can't do it. And then oftentimes I know, uh, I think one of the things that's responsible for a lot of, for some of the problems, no, we didn't have a lot of problems, but some of the events we had at, at, out at Hanford were directly related to the field office, Department of Energy Richland. Mm. They're great people and they're everything, but I, I, sometimes I think the guidance they gave and oftentimes as funding for a program was stopped at the end of a fiscal year, we were told, don't spend any more money on it, leave it as is, do something else. Well, that's kind of what happened at the PRF explosion. But it wasn't DOE, it wasn't the field office's fault. Strange. Can you, can you talk a bit more about that event? That was in the 97? Mm -hmm. um, were you, and you were working at PFP? I was in the training group, and uh, it occurred, uh, occurred on a weekend. And uh, so it uh, got to work, and I could actually, you could actually see the, the ex some, you could, you had to know what to look for, but you could see the external damage to the facility. Um, and of course, I had, uh, I had been involved in training the, the shift supervisor, who was, I was, I was at his oral board when he qualified as shift supervisor, because I supported oral, one of the things I got assigned with was supporting the oral boards. So I was at his oral board, and I I'd known him for some, and I thought he was probably one of our better shift supervisors at the plutonium finishing plant. But I hadn't. I noticed uh, as we did it, and then they came looking for the training packages. Well, we never we did initial training on operating the PRF, but it got stopped when they withdrew the money from it. So the I don't even know where the training packages were, uh, but they were concerned, and I noticed that that our emergency response to the event was flawed. Uh, we didn't respond well. Um, we hadn't trained, we hadn't, we hadn't trained on it, and uh, we hadn't really devoted a lot of time and effort to emergency preparedness. It hadn't been a focus. So I got, I got involved in the corrective action. I, I ended up teaching. We now instituted a drill program at the plant. So I got involved in uh, the drill training program in other words, how to train people that are working the drills. Mm -hmm. Many of us were military, so we understood how to run a training drill. No big thing. But we had a formal training program. Uh, we, uh, I ended up adding some material to the PIC training program. Um, so there were a lot of corrective actions, and uh, eventually we demonstrated readiness to go back to work. But the issue still was we were told to stop working at PRF. So just, and we... We didn't really devote that. We should have devoted time at that. We should have had the resources to look back at that and figure out what the hazards were that were still remaining in PRF. But we were told not to spend any more money on it. Mm -hmm. So when it's the end of the fiscal year and you've got no you've got no cost code to charge activities to, you don't work. Right. Oh, I, our project's grant funded. <laughs> a subcontractor, so I understand. You, um, can you talk a bit about, um, uh, so you, you would have been at Hanford during that, and uh, I think on patrol during that transition period, but when the Cold War ended, and then when production wrapped up, and we moved, we shifted to this new phase. I'm wondering if you could talk about that transition. Well, the big transition initially was, and the one that was much more harder to discern, was the transition from the, I'm not, from like, like the Carter administration, to the Reagan administration. And all, all of a sudden, it was much easier to see in the National Guard because all of a sudden new equipment starts showing up and you start getting money to, to train with and send, uh, send soldiers to schools. But here at Hanford, we start getting a new equipment. Um, that's when we, uh, uh, security had pretty much uh, done, a, we'd, we'd upgraded all our alarm systems, uh, but then we started getting money for communication systems. Hanford Patrol's tr initial entry training started changing they st and and I noticed it elsewhere in sight because we went from from um, kind of a standby mode as far as defense work did to actively producing material. Uh, it's really significant change, and uh, that went on for several years. And then the as the 
as the Reagan administration ended, and we went into the, to President Bush's administration, uh, the level of, of effort kind of reached its maximum as far as funding mm-hmm. for defense work. And then the, I remember when the wall came down, uh, we kind of backed off defense work and then, okay, stop that. We've got enough plutonium. We closed down Purex. Uh, FF, er, uh, FFTF was going away because they decided that the, that type of reactor wasn't going to be it. Uh, even though we had received funding from the Japanese to do work, so we and they couldn't find them, uh, they couldn't find research work for FFTF, so they start shutting it down. Um, even though it was at the time it was probably the most modern reactor the Department of Energy had, mm-hmm. uh, but we had never never gone to the idea of making a dual purpose reactor and producing power. We'd done the engineering studies for it, we'd done some of the preliminary design work, but we never installed that. I, th- I thought N-Reactor was... N-Reactor was, but we were going to do that to FFTF. So we'd actually, oh, okay. we'd actually, there was actually a piece of ground at the Fast Flux test facility where they were going to do that. Mm. And the engineering and preliminary design work had been done. Uh, so we kind of shifted from that, and it's, it's, it's as if we were struggling for a national energy policy. Where are we going to go? So we kind of, and the end reactor, uh, uh, when Chernobyl went, the end reactor, I believe, was in a fueling outage, its annual outage. Mm-hmm. So then we began to look at uh, the fact that the end reactor was uh, a unique reactor, uh, very effective, uh, very economical to run. Uh, Washington Public Power Supply System had built their generation plant next to it. Mm-hmm. But the, uh, the political, Chernobyl cost a lot of, well, obviously, it was a severe blow to the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. And the Ukrainian people are still having to deal with it. But the ramifications and fallout from any nu- any event in an industry, and nuclear is probably one of the more visible ones, causes a ripple effect elsewhere. And our ripple effect was we never... We did the engineering analysis, but the, I think the political outcry uh, was a little bit too much to to reopen their, or resume, resume production at the end reactor. Then also, we really didn't need any more plutonium. We had sufficient for national defense. So it, it kind of became the issue. It, and there's a lot of politics. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's go into that for a minute. Okay. Let's well, talk red and blue states. Uh, red being the party, a red state is a Republican state, a blue state being a uh, Democratic state. We are a blue state. Both U.S. senators come from the other side of the mountains. In this area, we have one voice in Congress who speaks for us, the local congressman. Um, so when even the Spokane, which is Republican too, when it begins to turn against this industry and this area, then it politically... It becomes no longer viable. Then, of course, we had uh, uh, a congressional delegation from Oregon was was uh, uh, speaking out against it. Mm. So it becomes politically unviable. Right, right. It's kind of Chernobyl kind of kicked off like a perfect storm to just kind of you know hurt the nuclear industry at, at Hanford. And then I believe it was 2000, there was an event in Japan, a criticality, mm-hmm. at a production facility. Uh, and that also caused a, a wave of consternation. Although it was interesting because one of the, one of the subjects I taught at, or instructed at PFP was criticality safety. And we were very diligent about it. Uh, we did refresher. Everyone got a, you had, you got your initial site training and then because you worked at PFP, you got a, we had a PFP specific class talking about the risks we had for criticality safety. And then we had a, an annual refresher course. So we looked at what it was going on in the industry using the lessons learned and some of the changes in process we were doing the plan. And we, it was usually a one to two hour uh, refresher class every year. So we're, we, we looked at all that, but when the Japanese had their event, it was kind of interesting. Some of the experts or the people I depended on to give me advice on what to put in the training event we're criticality safety experts from Northwest National Labs. And all of a sudden, I'm calling someone, and, well, he's not here. Well, where is he? Well, he's in Japan. Then I realized, okay. Wow. So some of, some of our top people um, in our industry, uh, from right here in, 
Ed Hanford went over to uh, deal with the issue. Interesting. Um, you worked for a lot of different contractors. That's always kind <laughs> of a, um, it's, it's interesting to me how, you know, because we say Hanford site, but that, that really obscures the, the organizational, the organization of the site and the work. And I was just wondering if you could talk a bit of, uh, more about that shifting between contractors like that and, and you know, what that, how that affected the mission of the site, how that might have affected employee morale, and how it kind of affected you personally. Well, I think that the big transition, because I'd gotten here after Rockwell had come in. So I'm working for Safeguard and Security, Site Safeguard and Security, and I'm a, I get my paycheck from Rockwell. But I work at 300 area, which in those days was, United Nuclear was about 10 to 15% of the puzzle, because I knew, I, I saw where the, our funding was for security services coming from. But most of it came from Westinghouse Hanford and uh, Northwest National Labs, Battelle Memorial. And I noticed that working with their security staffs uh, from all four companies, that they were very, Northwest National Labs was very, very different. Uh, the people they had working their security programs were security professionals. Uh, they were very much into assets protection, uh, not only people, but information and also property. So assets protection was very big for them. One of the things that I, the first thing that struck me was when I uh, went to work at 300 area, they've got a book, Three Ring Binder, and it's got every one of their facilities with a floor plan and a description of what's there. Is there any special nuclear material there? Are there any are there any classified document storage areas? You know what 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 is the security force protecting? That was incredible. No one else had one. Westinghouse was pretty much on the same level, very much in administrative uh, security. Uh, great programs. Um, if you needed, uh, if if something unusual happened and you needed their management's approval on it to get it, you were talking on the phone with those people and usually within three to five minutes, they'd be calling you. And I just, incredible. They had a different mindset. They were building FFTF at the time and they were very much, uh, their corporate and company philosophy was very much on operating react because they, they, built, they built reactors, they built reactor vessels themselves. So they were very much into that commercial uh, power production. Uh, they were large, large government contractor, not only for DOE, but other agencies. They made, you know, they made, a lot, did a lot of defense work. Uh, they did a lot of um, work for other federal agencies, Department of Treasury, uh, Department of Interior, uh, Department of Justice. So there was a big mindset of meeting the customer's needs uh, very, very employee. Westinghouse was very employee oriented. Of course, they were only about 1,500 employees, whereas Rockwell was several thousand more. But there was a uh, so it was very interesting being working for Rockwell, but being in a in a Westinghouse Battelle UNC facility. Mm -hmm. So I kind of I kind of we kind of felt like um, orphans. It's like no, I'm very serious. Uh, each one of the contractors had their own company newspaper. So Rockwell, we get it two or three days later. Westinghouse, the day it was published, it was brought by our building too. Even though everyone that worked in that building, except for the janitor, the custodial staff, was a Rockwell employee. Westinghouse delivered, and we were, they reached out to us. And then when cons when they run the big, at that time, and then that's when DOE, DOE field office went to one big contractor. Of course, Battelle had their own thing, so that net didn't change. And uh, but all of a sudden. It's like the management of my own group was, was very, they worked in a Rockwell facility at the north end of the site. They weren't too happy. And then, but we didn't have any problems making the transition, but they did. Mm. So, and it was, it was, it was, it was uh, there was a lot of turmoil, in, or not a lot, but there was a significant amount of turmoil in the north end of the site, particularly in safeguard and security, because all, all of a sudden Westinghouse had a successful program and they went out there and they weren't impressed by some of the uh, programs they found. Oh, so that that's a reason then for some of that turmoil or oh, yeah. hard feelings. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, Westing, Westinghouse, uh, 
you didn't want to lose control of special nuclear material. That's really a bad thing. Yeah. In Westinghouse's standard, how they admi did their administrative program and their, and their controls uh, was, was much more developed, much more thorough. Mm. Uh, so when they moved in and uh, so now they're taking over a plutonium finishing plant, which had a large amount of plutonium back in the days. And they weren't, it was kind of a shock to Westinghouse, oh, we, we've got all this, before it was just fuel components. Mm -hmm. Now they've got weapons grade material that's designed for ultimate defense work, or the end, end use being defense work. So there was a little turmoil there, but then it, in about six months it all kind of evaporated. Mm -hmm. And then employees were actually sad when Westinghouse left, because Westinghouse was much more attuned to uh, employee communication, employee benefits, uh, Rockwell, it was kind of interesting. I, I remember one time I had to go to Easter. So this is where Rockwell's, Hanford's corporate office was. I go out there and I'm walking around and I look in, in, all, these, in all these offices, and even, even in cubicles, because there were some offices, but there's also cubicle land. You'd walk out and you see pictures of the B-1 bomber, which was a Rockwell uh, aircraft, mm -hmm. when, when Rockwell still made aircraft. And I'm looking around and... and down at Westinghouse, everyone was an ex-Navy nuke or ex-commercial power nuke, or many people were. But out at Rockwell, they were all refugees from when the B-1 program got canceled, so they, Rockwell moved all these engineers out here. So it was, it was a very different mindset, the aviation versus naval nuclear and the commercial nuclear industry. Interesting. Um, so you said Rockwell was the... the Aviation. Yeah, the North, North American Rockwell, the old aviation company. One, uh, the, probably the most famous aircraft that I'm sure they've made other ones, but the one that, that comes to mind is, is the P-51 Mustang. Oh, okay. That was their, that was their, that was their biggie. Um, you've mentioned of the older security systems that were still in place in the 80s from the, you said analog. And what, what, what is an, an what would, can you give me an example of an analog security system? Well, it was a system where at the point the point of where the actual, shall we say, sensor, whether it's a magnetic or whatever, when contact is broken, it sends, you lose loss of connectivity. Mm -hmm. So it would send a signal and it would, the little pan, little mechanical panel would go red or and make an audible tone mm -hmm. and go red. So kind of a, a dated technology, whereas... How, how would you track that from a central area? Well, it'd be hardwired, usually to a facility that would be nearby. Okay. Um, at PFP, the alarm facility, the central alarm facility, was a little wooden building. No, I'm serious. I that you. was near the near the main uh, entry point into the plant. Okay. So, um, but a more modern system would you could actually, you know, you'd get you'd uh, your signal would it would. Um, you could actually query the signal to see the strength of signal, and is it a, is is it because the system is is there's a power problem, is, in other words, is there a problem with the system, or is there an actual alarm? So you could query it back, and then, then there were there were no microwaves, there were no, um, they were usually uh, their presence detectors were very limited in, in capability, and obviously no cameras or very few cameras. When uh, so like CCTV would yeah. have been a big. Well, um, introduction. so when they did when they did install CCTV, there was um, the 308 Fuels Production Facility was the first one to bring it online. They actually had, you could see the entry point into the, the secured area. You could see the hallways. You could see the primary rooms where the primary uh, points of value were. And then you know, on the perimeter, they installed pen. They not only had fixed cameras, but pen tilt zoom. And they also had cameras with low light capability with floodlights on them, so it was much, and there was, also, there was actually a perimeter fence line and security system. Although the 300 area was kind of dicey because we were retrofitting a, syst a security system into an area where there'd been none. So there's some areas you couldn't put a double fence line, so we ended up with a single fence line uh, supplanted with uh, motion detectors, microwave motion detectors. Oh, wow. And then they also had a uh, they had a fence that was monitored. Uh, they called it a taut wire system because it was a it was a weapon that was tight, but it, if it were touched, um, and sometimes by small animals 
or tumble, tumbleweed, and we seem to have some of that out here at Anford, mm -hmm. it would go off. So you take a look on the camera, see what it was. Oh, okay. Yeah, I bet that would help you reduce a lot of false, uh, false alarms. Well, one year after a fire, uh, we seem to have fires out at, well, range fires are Hanford or not unknown, but we had one fi fire, and I can remember at FFTF that the debris from the fire kept plugging up our perimeter system for several days thereafter until, they, until we got a work crew in there to actually pick up the debris and, and uh, the partially burned pieces and the full tumbleweeds because the fire would generate a lot of uh, heat and air. So not only do you have debris from the fire itself, but you also have uh, debris being moved by the air currents and the wind, the way the, way the wind was uh, blowing off uh, Rattlesnake Mountain. Mm. Um, did you, um, sorry, I'm just looking over some of my notes uh, here. Um, and I wanted to ask you about, um, oh shoot. Um, it, it says here that it, in the 1980s, um, you helped during a 1980 or an anti-nuclear protest. Oh, I remember that. No, I didn't do it. I was on duty that day. And what we'd done is there were there, in the 80s we had nuclear anti-nuclear protests, and we believed that one was going to be big. So safeguard and security and the, and half patrol being a uniform service, uh, they pulled a lot of us into work that day, and then they took key people. Uh, and they actually had buses from site transportation. They were going to take care of the tra the demonstrators, because once they crossed into the onto the federal building property, that was DOE's area of responsibility, mm -hmm. no longer the city's. Uh, uh, so anyway, there's about there weren't that many protesters, perhaps 20 to 40 at most downtown. So we've got all these people in there. We probably had 50 to 70 people staged and ready to go. Get the buses, because, you know, put them on the buses and take them to a federal magistrate. And then all of a sudden, there's a call come out. There's people without badges inside West Area at the north end of the site. And apparently what, and, so, and we're, we're down, in, and, and, at the, and I was, I think I was at, I was uh, either, I can't remember if I was at 300 area in the alarm facility or 400 area. But I'm listening to this, and all of a sudden the frequency is going crazy. The patrol's primary operating frequency, and then our secondary, fre the tactical frequency, is getting busy too. And um, you can hear the voices on the radio. A little bit of stress going on, and and then it, it, it and we're all la we're all laughing like hell because you know, hey, well, that's where the that's where the weapons grade material is. Aren't we protecting that? So we're we're her of course we were heretics. But so we're 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 giggling, you know. It's it's funny because and it's not happening to us. It's happening to someone else. And because uh, we had additional staff at 300, and we had additional staff at FFTF because it's operating reactor at the time. So apparently, what the demonstrators had done is they walked in from Highway 240, and West Area isn't that far in. They'd walked in, hopped over the outer fence, a single fence line at West Area, hopped over the fence line at West Area, and they're marching towards. And of course, unless you know the West Area. The big, tall, long buildings all look alike. They all got stacks and water towers. So mm -hmm. they, you can't tell the difference between one of the old canyon buildings, one of the old production facilities, and a PFP. So all of a sudden, they've got protesters in West Area, but all their resources, except for the bare minimum, are downtown. Right. But then it gets even better. They When they got the protesters, they put them on a bus, and they thought they'd just be going to district court in Kennewick. No. Took them to a federal magistrate mm -hmm. <laughs> out of town. Wow. Yeah. So it w it was it was kind of funny. But we had gone and uh, the funny thing was uh, because of the they actually uh, in those days most of us wore a tactical uniform camouflage or whatever, but the people who were actually going to detain and transport the protesters all had to be in full uniform, you know, pants and shirt and badge and. So it was it was uh, it was one of the better events. Um, I interviewed a gentleman a while back who worked at PFP who talked about when they would load the product up and there would there would be very heavy um, security and, and kind of people that almost looked like they were in black ops to, or you oh. know like kind of very and I was wondering if you could were you ever involved in any of that or well or they you Department of Energy had a courier program. And they were based, I think, at Albuquerque at the time. 
And they usually had uh, a, a transport vehicle and escort vehicles. And uh, they were specially trained to protect the shipments. There's other ways to move things, uh, but usually once a weapon is produced, it's turned over to the military and their transport is, is their responsibility. But components, whether it's plutonium or whatever, would usually be transported by the courier group. Okay. So, and then when they, when they took all the material out, and that happened while I was, uh, that was, probably most of that was done while I was in Afghanistan. It was the same courier group. And they had uh, extremely uh, good communications, so it always be known where they were, and there were contingency plans on well, a case there was ever an event. And I don't think they ever, other than a mechanical failure of the vehicle, I don't think they ever had an event. Okay. And, of course, protesters were always fixated on, uh, you know, the, the media was always fixated on the white train. You know, okay. <laughs> I've never seen one, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what were the most challenging and rewarding aspects of working at Hanford? The, the most rewarding one was, uh, I think, the people. And at, when I worked in training, I, I got to know everyone, in the, almost everyone in the plant would come to one of our training events. I mean, some groups need to, you know, uh, the, high, the higher risk job, the more training you got. So it was working with the people, and then um, some people it was just a paycheck. But the, the employees who took pride in their work and enjoyed their work, uh, those were always the, 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 the fun people to be with. And not that they were there for fun, but just it was very rewarding to work with them. Um, now, I'm now I'm retired, and uh, I still see someone around the, around the community. So it's always fun to see someone that, that I uh, spent, you know, worked with. I still see the vice president of the Steelworkers local because uh, I, I got to work closely with him. Um, so to, to see those people and, and to see their successes and um, – to do that. The difficult part sometimes was employees who were just there or people who were just there for the paycheck or strongly through personal issues, uh, being able to trying to help, help them or to get a, a shift, a, a, a work crew doing a work package. They're people. And the, the strength of any group is always at the the level of the lowest performer. Mm -hmm. So the the the, the performers who, who were struggling, those were the tough, or the ones who were. Uh, sometimes you get cynical; people get emotional, mm -hmm. and dealing with the cynicism. Uh, I think one of the, one of the toughest things I ever had was uh, I wasn't involved in the project. I was training, but I wasn't the trainer for that particular project but I was doing some other training. And um, they worked hard. They were staging the materials. Uh, I think it was the pencil tank reduction at PFP. They were about to take the pencil tanks, clean them up, reduce them in size, and then shift them off the scrap. And they were working hard to get the materials, to write the pre procedures to do the job, uh, get their training in order, and get ready to go. In the aftermath, when Department of Energy said, well, we're not going to do that right now. But materials had already been, uh, a considerable amount of resources had been pushed in that project to get it ready to go. But then Department of Energy said, well, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to take that money and we're going to do it, use, use it for something else. Um, planning at Hanford is always one of our toughest things, has been for years. There's so many uh, things we did that were never came off or things changed. Uh, not too far from here are the bus lots at 1100 area. We sp and the parking lots at 300 area. We spent a lot of money, or the government spent a lot of money improving those parking lots, making sure they had the good drainage and so on and so forth, and improving the bus lot, making a much safer, much more efficient operation. And then we canceled bus service. And a couple years later, uh, I know that our local law enforcement, I think uh, Richland Police Department, I uh, used it for a, a pursuit driving course, a piece of ground, and now now it's gone commercial. But all the things we do, and then all of a sudden, 
boom. We never real never realized the full value of what we what we had spent money on. Mm-hmm. You kind of, a, I'm, I'm sensing from that uh, from that and a comment you made earlier about the um, lack of energy focus. Maybe there's, there's, you see kind of a lack of focus in, in Hanford or kind of surrounds some some activities at Hanford. I I think when uh, Congressman Foley, Tom Foley, was uh, Speaker of the House. And he was from, let's see, we're for, I've got 5th Congressional District in Spokane, uh, Speaker Foley. Speaker, F- and this was probably about the time of the Chernobyl issue and all that. Uh, Speaker Foley proposed in a public statement that transitioning uh, Hanford from uh, Department of Energy back to Corps Engineers. And knowing, knowing a, a lot of engineers, Army engineers, and I, you know, they're great people, and they do great. They do great things. And I looked at that, and I go, I don't think that's the right move. But now looking back on it, and having worked with the Corps engineers in both in the reconstruction of Iraq uh, before we withdrew, and then a lot of the work they've there've been some mistakes and a lot of mistakes in Afghanistan and Iraq. But looking at some of their work they've done there, I hate to admit it, but I think Tom was right. Hmm. We should have switched because I think the Corps engineers uh, is a lot more focused and a lot more planning because they, they don't look at, oh, we're going to they, – they, I think the Corps looks at the long term, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and looks, and looks for a strategy. Whereas I see Department of Energy particularly – and I know the field offices are all different. What what you, I saw in DOE Albuquerque was different than DOE RL, was different than DOE Rocky Flats. I think the Department of Energy field offices, or the, particularly Richland, focused on the near term, not the long term. The near term being this fiscal year and maybe next, but I see that uh, in, in working with uh, but, uh, Northwest National Labs, I noticed they were always looking at where we're going to be in four or five years. Mm-hmm. And I think, because uh, I got to, uh, with the Army, I got to support a couple of their projects. Then it was in Afghanistan. We were doing something, and I needed some reachback capability. So unofficially, I reached back to Botel Memorial, or Northwest National Labs, to give me help on something in Afghanistan that I was encountering. And it took me a couple days to find the right person and, and then get him up on a secure, I'm not Hillary, so I used a, I, all my emails were in the secure system, and to reach out and get that information so how we could be more effective in Afghanistan. And so I, I saw that kind of work, and I see, you know, dealing with uh, them and watching what they're doing, I see they're looking at the, at the, you know, they look out, they forecast out in the future, what's it going to be like in 10, 15, 20 years? What's the end state? Uh, I think RL has gotten in the, or particularly my time, they were in the survival mode, mm-hmm. reacting rather than planning. Yeah. I think one of the key uh, losses we had, uh, we had the, the DOE RL manager at one time was a guy by the name of Mike Lawrence. And later he left, And but I noticed when he left, uh, I think Mr. Lawrence, was, he, he planned, he looked at things. He tried to anticipate where the federal budget was going and what the program's going to be. And I think that... After that, it became a more reactive mm-hmm. group. And now I continue to watch, and I watch them. We were spending money, apparently taxpayers were spending money on the upgrading the federal building because they're the primary, primary occupant there. Mm-hmm. And then you decide, no, we're going to move our office, we're going to move our staff out to the Stevens Center complex, uh, which is right off uh, between G- George Washington Way and Stevens. So we're going to move out there. So I'm thinking, oh, okay, that's going to cost a little bit of money. And then what's going to happen to the contractor employees there? Well, they're going to uh, – so just – the taxpayer owns the federal building. Mm-hmm. But the Stevens Center is leased facilities. So, yeah, just – I can't figure that out. God bless them, but I can't figure it out. Yeah, we, we exist in a similar thing here. Our project is in a leased facility, and, and that seems to be the way that – That's I, I would I would agree with you that that is – there's more of focus recently on near, our near-term solutions, especially here in the term, than long-term solutions. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe because long-terms are scary. Yeah. But well, uh, you got to uh, let's see what they say in the art. Oh, embrace the suck. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there? 
Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you'd like to cover? Well, it was it was interesting being in, a, at, at, in the half patrol initially and watching them come from a more um, security force that was designed just to check badges and check classified repositories and respond to alarms, become a more professional force. It was really exciting watching their training group. Uh, when I first came there, you they'd get up and read a manual, and that was your training. Uh, their firearms training was superb, best I've ever had. Um, probably better than anything I've seen even in... I would put their marksmen up against uh, the best of the best, whether it's the HRT and the Bureau. Uh, definitely, I think they can outshoot the Ranger, but I'm uh, not criticizing the Army Rangers, but I think they can out, their, their people can outshoot Army Rangers and perhaps um, uh, Force Recon in the Marine Corps. Uh, I think they're up there with, with the more elite organizations. Uh, and I think that, that, that firearms training was incredible. Uh, they took people who couldn't shoot, and they teach them theory and technique, and then work with them and, and find the faults and get them to correct it to, the, to that point. I've never seen anything like that in any law enforcement academy or any military training. It was grill, but the rest of it, there was no lesson plans. No, no one, no, no. Training is always analysis, design, development, implementation. Where you get up and teach it, and then evaluate it, see if it, see if the training took. Mm -hmm. I didn't see that in half in in oh, Rockwell's training program for the Secret Security Team uh, Force. But eventually, to see them as as when Westinghouse took over, they started putting those standards in. And I think Department of Energy did it nationwide. So I think watching that tra change and transition was was exciting. It was great stuff. Um, so I, uh, I, I, it, it was it was an exciting place to work. Uh, and now right now they're they're tearing down the plutonium finishing plant where I spent what 17, 18 years of my life, except for some trips elsewhere. Um, but to see that come down, but then to realize what we achieved there. I was there the day uh, a button caught fire, a plutonium button. That was exciting because uh, we were testing out the security system. And why do we have employees taking their clothes off in the hallway on camera? So what's going on here? And then call up the building emergency. Is something going on inside the plant you, you kind of should let us know about? And why is the fire department coming? So, you know, just and then, and then watching it... Uh, uh, go through things and then eventually uh, uh, watching the cleanup process, stabilizing plutonium, and uh, seeing what where that goes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm glad I had an opportunity to come in today to talk a little bit about what, what it was like to work at Hanford. I remember when we had buses and then we didn't have buses because they decided they didn't need it anymore. And then watching the density of vehicles on the highways going out to work on site. I can remember um, when they decided that uh, there's a four-lane road. Stevens is a four-lane divided highway out to the site. So, and there's, you know, when you're doing remediation and, and, and const you're constructing the VIT plant, and other, there's a lot of trucks and trailers with heavy loads are in the right-hand lane. Mm -hmm. So then someone came up with a bright idea, well, we're going to have the, and they're slower moving, so we're going to have that traffic in the left-hand lane going northbound and everyone going, you know, Everyone that can drive the speed limit or what, or those going beyond the speed limit will drive in the right-hand lane. Excuse me? Mm -hmm. Really? Really? And then we, then there was a thing when we decided to put, di you know, how far it is from this place to this place. So, the, and, and we're going to do it both in the English system and also in metric. Good idea. That, that works sense, you know, because a lot of the world is metric. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So then they put the signs up and they put the, the letters are about that high in a 55 mile an hour zone. So... How close do you have to be to read a sign where it's got letters that are about two inches high going 55 miles an hour? Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> that way. And, and also, that's now, that's, uh, isn't that kind of like a, a, in, a visual impediment to traffic safety? Yeah. And then, then the other one is right up, right up on Stevens at 300 area. They put, you've got 300 area, you've got the, I can't remember the name of the street. It comes out and goes on to Stevens, or we used to have our own highway system out there, so it's called, that's called Highway 4 South. So the traffic is going uh, west onto a north-south, or onto a uh, road that's uh, in the right-hand lanes, or in the right-hand side, it's going north. So, but you want to turn left and head back into town. So they put a stop sign on a wooden post right at the stop line, 
well, it's right on the edge of the traffic. It's right on the traffic lane. So about every week or so, you know, low light, it's not well lit, you get weather. So all of a sudden, you know, about every once a week, you'd see the, the stop sign about 10 meters over with the pole broken off, the big, you know, a four by four wooden post. So I remember one time I get, geez, that's not very bright. So I put in a safety suggestion. And uh, so they thanked me for my safety suggestion, gave me a little, Rockwell Hanford gave me a little um, product, you know, worth, you know, 50, 60 cents. So thank you. And okay, thank you. but we're not going to do that. And, and we've already considered it and it's safe. So, and, uh, and I got that and I was working shift work. So I'm going home about seven in the morning and there's the stop sign over there on it, on the sign sheared off again. So all of a sudden it never got installed again. <laughs> <laughs> they painted a stop sign, they painted stop letters, and they moved the sign back. <laughs> wow. But my suggestion wasn't good. <laughs> so we had, that was kind of fun. Wow. Well, but, thank you so much, Bob. Yeah. I really appreciate you coming in today and, and, and giving us a slice of it. Well, you know, thank you because uh, for doing this because um, the Manhattan Project was such an important piece in our history. And being having taken a history course and... Being a, a former national, a retired National Guardsman, I, and the son of a World War II veteran uh, from the Pacific Theater, and seeing the carnage that was Okinawa, and then realizing what the invasion of Japan would have been, and I, I think that puts it all in perspective. And then the work we did, and for me, as a veteran, the big night was the night the wall came down in Berlin. Because uh, that, that not only put my weekend job in perspective, uh, but it also put the work we'd, we'd done on at Hanford. So, and then, uh, so I, I think we can, tr and then the work they do at the national labs and the, the, and when we had a criticality safety lab on site, the work that they did at those facilities, just incredible. Mm -hmm. I just wish we could have uh, kept FFTF and made it and done power production there beautiful reactor. I mean, it had an availability rate almost 100%. And uh, so, but it, it's all about people. Yeah. So. Hey, well, thank you so much. Well, thank you Appreciate for having it. me. Yeah.